Welcome to Informed. This is interactive Bible study. In fact, it's where you get your Bible questions answered. So we're here on Informed as we continue in this season one to bring to you the answers to your Bible questions. And of course, I have with me Elder Andy David to help us answer this question. Elder Andy David, welcome to Inform. How are you doing today? Well, thank you. I'm doing fine. Happy to be here again as we proceed with this new program. Excellent. I, I almost tagged this, this episode of, of, of um, Inform Men in Black. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we're, we, we are here to answer the question. So how do you get your questions to us? We, you send it in by email to victoryinjesusministries1 at gmail.com. And we will be answering your questions from your emails. You can always drop a, a, a comment in YouTube in the comment section and we will respond to your comments accordingly. But we're going to move on with this, another episode of Informed. So, Dr. David, we have some questions today which uh, could very well be, um, as some people say, they will, they're, they're going to do us in because there are some big questions. But um, I know once you have questions, the Bible have answers. Definitely. All right. So, um, we're going to look at our first question. And this question comes from Tamara. Tamara says, I am not in the best of health and has not been for some time now. I've been seeing the doctors for years. I recently accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. What applicable health principles are found in the Bible? So she wants to know about the health principles found in the Bible. Okay. Uh, first, Elder Vaughan and Tamara, I took note of the fact that you said that you are a recent convert. You know, I would like to congratulate you on that. I think a decision to serve Christ is the best and the most important decision one can make. So congratulations on that. I am sorry to hear that you're not doing well health-wise. Now, your question is whether or not the Bible has uh, health principles that can help, that you can follow. Well, certainly, the Bible has uh, health principles. Now, God, I would like to say, first of all, is interested in our well-being, Elder Vaughan and mm -hmm. Tamara. And that is why he says to us in 3 John chapter 1 and verse 2, he says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health. Mm -hmm. So God is interested in our well-being, is interested in our health. And, and, and because God is interested in our health, Elder Vaughan and Tamara, he has given us instructions that we should follow regarding health. Instructions that we should follow if we're going to be healthy. And, and, and a lot of it has to do with what we eat. All right? Okay. The so, diet, so, so the diet, diet is very important. Diet is very important. All right. And the Bible has a lot to say on that. Now, I would like to say that God created us out of one and tomorrow. All right? And because God created us, he knows best what we should eat. He knows what the best diet is for us. All right? He knows what the, the, the best diet to keep us healthy. Now, well, what did God say is best for us? Let's look at what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 29. All right, and Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16, the Bible says, And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be food. All right? And then the Bible says, for in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 16, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat of every tree. So when God created man, Elder Vaughan, and Tamara, he gave them a plant-based diet. Okay. A diet with grains, nuts, and vegetables. All right? Grains and fruits and nuts and vegetables. And, and scientists have proven that those who, he, who eat a plant-based diet, Elder Vaughan, live healthier lives. Okay. They live healthier lives. Excellent. All right? Mm -hmm. So a plant-based diet is ideal, is God's ideal diet for us. But God did allow Elder Vaughan meat eating a bit later. And that was so because after the flood, all of the vegetation on earth was destroyed. Okay. And so God allowed the eating of meat. All right? Now... But it is not all animals that are good for food. Okay. The Bible makes the distinction of what animals are good for food and what are not good for food. 
Now, we don't have the time to delve into all of that. But if you take a look at Leviticus chapter 11 tomorrow, there is a list of the animals that God uh, have there that we can eat that are good for food. Now, so the first health principle here is to follow a proper diet. Okay. Follow a proper diet, preferably a plant-based diet tomorrow. All right. Now, if you must eat meat, it should be the clean ones, which you can see in Leviticus 11. All right. Now, the other thing I want to say here is that God has given us the ideal diet, which we say is a plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. And even though the plant-based diet elephant is the best one, we still need to eat in moderation. All right? We should be temperate in what we do. We should do. be temperate in what we All do. Right. Mm -hmm. All right? So eat a healthy diet, plant-based preferably, mm -hmm. in moderation. That's the first uh, health principle. Follow a good diet. All right? Now, we should eat in moderation. Mm -hmm. we, all, all, we just said we should be temperate. Now, the Bible tells us in Luke, all right, that overeating is a sin. It says we should avoid carousing. Okay. All right? Mm -hmm. We should avoid carousing. Then the other thing we want to look at, the other principle we want to look at, we should eat a healthy diet. We should not overeat. We should be moderate. Mm -hmm. The Bible also talks about uh, alcohol and the fact that we should stay away from alcohol. It says in Proverbs 20 and verse 1, wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. All right? The Bible says further, those who go in search of mixed wine, <clears throat> do not look at the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly, at the last it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Proverbs 23, 31 and 32. All right? And we all know Elder Vaughan from reading about the negative effects that alcohol can have on our organs, our liver in particular. Certainly, yes, yes, yes. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, I know of people who would have died from cirrhosis of the liver mm -hmm. from um, excessive intake of alcohol, all right? So we want to have proper sleep. Rest is important, all right? Exercise is important. And I dare say, Elder Vaughan, we can't mention all of the health principles here. There are quite a few, but we're just going to give these. I'll, I'll give you one last one. <clears throat> we should avoid stressful situations. We should avoid stressful situations. Don't harbor envy or hold grudges, all right? These kinds of sinful feelings actually disrupt the body's processes, Elder Vaughan. All right, the Bible says that envy rottens the bones, mm. all right? So says Proverbs 14 and verse 30. Christ even commands us to clear up grudges that we have for others or that others might hold against us. We can see that in Matthew uh, chapter 5. 23 and 24. I'll just say in closing here. Now, yes, we are to follow a good diet. We should stay away from alcohol. We should get adequate rest. We should seek to get exercise. But Elvon and tomorrow, because we live in a sinful world, even though we may follow a good diet, we may follow all of the health principles in the Bible, there are times when we may get sick and still die. That is why it is important for us to live our lives for Christ, so that when we die, because we would have lived for him tomorrow, we will have a chance at life everlasting. Yeah, because of course, you know, we, we, we're not saying here that <laughs> eating, and uh, Tamara was asking about health principles, and that, I don't believe she's asking about how can she eat and live forever. Um, <laughs> eating and eating a healthy diet, according to the Bible, according to what we, you, have, you have shown us here in terms of having a proper diet, which is plant base as, as much as possible. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to live extremely longer than anyone else. Things may happen in life where you may die, but the point is that within, <clears throat> with eating properly, with not having stressful situations, because what I hear you saying is that stress can cause the physical body to deteriorate or to affect it as well. Exactly. So having the peace of mind mm -hmm. in having Christ as your savior, having that reassurance of Christ is there no matter what the stressful situation is, also is a part of 
total health. Yes. And so... And it speaks to the quality of life that we can enjoy. Absolutely, the quality of life. <laughs> so tomorrow we, we, we pray that, you know, um, and also prevention is better than uh, a pound of cure, they say. Um, in your situation, we just pray that as you look at these principles that the Bible put forward, that you could probably employ them now and you could try and um, have that trust as you have given your heart to Christ already, have that trust in him that he will see you to God works in ways in which you will not even understand. So put your trust in him, apply those health principles that we've mentioned, there are many others, and the Lord is going to see you too. All right, I think that was well answered, Elder David. What else do we have? What other questions do we have? We have today? another question here, Elder Vaughan. This one comes from Cliff. It says, is baptism really essential in accepting Jesus Christ? The thief on the cross was not baptized, yet Jesus promised him that he will be in paradise with him when he comes into his kingdom. Ah, uh, thank you, Cliff. That's a very good question. Um, you're asking about whether baptism is essential in accepting Jesus Christ. I'm going to answer the specific question that you asked um, because, of course, that's what you're looking for. But I'm going to introduce some other stuff that will help us to understand baptism on a whole, Elder David. Mm -hmm. So Cliff is asking if baptism is essential in accepting Jesus Christ. If I understand the question correctly, he's asking that if we need to be baptized to accept Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Well, the short answer could be Elder David, the short answer is no. Mm -hmm. But let me explain how baptism plays a part in, from, from a biblical standpoint. The fact is when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are saved through the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Amen. We are not saved anywhere else. Amen. But the Bible clearly says, and it gives over and over again, where individuals are called to demonstrate their new belief in Christ, mm -hmm. their new acceptance of Christ. Mm -hmm. So they've accepted Christ, and they want to show to the world that, hey, because I've accepted Christ, and I understand what he's calling me to, I'm going to do as he asks to be baptized. So here is it that the Bible mentions baptism some 97 times. It only mentions the cross uh, 28 times. So then I was thinking, Elder David, that this must be important. Must. The Bible is mentioning baptism so many times, it has to be important. Definitely. And so is baptism essentially in accepting um, Jesus Christ? Well, let me explain. In Mark 16, verse 16, it says, He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Mm -hmm. Cliff, that seems pretty clear to me, Elder David. Mm -hmm. It says that if you believe and you are baptized, you will be saved. But if you do not believe, you'll be condemned. So we have incidences, Cliff and Elder David, of people who are being baptized in the Bible. In, 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 Acts, 20, in Acts chapter 2, verse 37 to 38, this happened on the day of Pentecost. And for those of us who understand or know the Bible, it's pretty easy to follow. But for those of you who don't, on the day of Pentecost is when the Holy Spirit came down to the disciples in a very emphatic way. They spoke with other languages, mm -hmm. and Peter stood up on that day to preach. And when he preached a sermon, the people who were listening in Jerusalem on that day, it was a, it was, it was a religious festival where people from all around the world, Jews, came to, 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 um, to Jerusalem to, to have this festive um, celebration. Mm -hmm. Peter preached Elder David. And the people were pricked in their hearts. The sermon touched them, right? Mm -hmm. Because Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost. And here's what it says in Acts, 20, Acts chapter 2, verse 37 and 30. It says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy, Holy Ghost. Ghost. Amen. Here Peter says, now repent and be baptized, be baptized mm -hmm. every one of you. And then we have Elder David, other, I'll just mention a few, other persons in the Bible who were baptized, the Ethiopian treasurer or the Ethiopian eunuch, as some mm -hmm. people refer to him as, in Acts chapter 8, verse 26 to 39, he was baptized when he heard the message. Mm -hmm. The Philippian jailer, in, 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 in Acts 16, 23 to 34, he was baptized the same night when he heard the message of Christ. We have Saul of Tarsus. Everybody knows Saul that um, became Paul the Apostle. Saul was baptized after he had the Damascus Road experience where he was blinded and he had to go stay in, in, in the Damascus um, in this street called Straight and he was baptized three days after. And of course, we have Elder, Elder um, David 
Jesus. Mm -hmm. Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River yes. by John the baptizer. But what does baptism really mean? Because Cliff, we have to understand baptism and the root of where it's coming from and what it means. So what does baptism mean? If you look at Romans chapter 6, verse um, 4 to 6, it says, We were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also shall walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Baptism, Elder David and Cliff represents mm -hmm. the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus that, that mm -hmm. Jesus has done. Mm -hmm. So it's symbolic. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what it means is that, or what it symbolizes is that when you're being baptized, and baptism is by immersion, that's a whole other study because some people talk about baptism being by sprinkling or by pouring. Well, baptism in the Bible is by immersion. You go when, under. You, when you go under the water, exactly, Elder David, when you go under the water, you more often than not, close your eyes, hold your breaths. It is a form of being dead under the water. And then when you're raised out of the water, you open your eyes and you breathe your breath. It's the resurrection. Mm -hmm. So it is symbolic in that you're partaking in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ because you have accepted Christ. And know that acceptance of Christ comes before baptism. Some people want to go into the water and want to be baptized but they haven't actually accepted Christ in their heart. Mm -hmm. So that's how it works, Cliff. So here is it that, although it's symbolic, the question you ask is that, is it essential to accept Christ? Well, the thief on the cross never was baptized. That's true. You mentioned that in your question, Cliff. He was never baptized. But Elder David, Christ promised him that he would be with him in his kingdom, when he come into his kingdom. Yep. But note this. The thief on the cross didn't restore what he stole. Mm -hmm. He didn't go back and give back what he stole. In, in, in Ezekiel 33, verse 15, Moses, sorry, in Ezekiel 33, verse 15, the Bible speaks about what you ought to do if you steal something, you ought to restore mm -hmm. it. But mm -hmm. the thief didn't restore it. Because he didn't have an opportunity. He didn't have an opportunity. And that's the point, Cliff. And thank you, Elder David, is that, is that Christ understands limitations. Mm -hmm. And the thief on the cross could not come down off the cross and go and restore what he stole or come down and go and baptize him and then put him back on the cross. It's impractical. It wasn't going to happen. The Romans wasn't going to allow it anyway. And so, Elder, Elder, Elder mm -hmm. Joseph, had he the opportunity, mm -hmm. could he have come down and, 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 and go get baptized having ex demonstrated faith in Christ on the cross? Mm -hmm. Do you think he would have gone? I certainly think so. If he had the opportunity to do so, he would have done so because it shows that he had a repentant heart. And he had accepted Christ right there on the cross. But he could not come down off the cross and be baptized. But if he had the opportunity to do so, I believe certainly he would because it's, it's a change of heart. Mm -hmm. And when your heart and is changed, then you follow, up, follow it up, if practical or possible, with baptism. Amen. All right? So I just want to mention a few things here because I want people to understand this baptism. And Cliff, I hope the answer is sufficient for you. I want people to understand what baptism doesn't do. Baptism itself does not change the heart. Mm -hmm. I can go and put you in the sea or in a, in a river and say, and you say, I want to get baptized, but you're not connected to Christ. He doesn't change the heart. Baptism does not make a person feel better. It's not about emotions and you expect to go under the water and come out and you feel like Superman or something. I mean, I know one person I got baptized and he said that his baptism, he actually felt different because the water was in a pool and it was extremely cold. <laughs> and when he came out of the water, he, he would say, oh, I feel like a changed man. But, you know, it's not about emotions, um, Cliff or Elder mm -hmm. David. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Baptism does not remove temptations. Christians still have temptations. Baptism is not some magical right to guarantee salvation. Salvation is gotten only by accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior. So those four things baptism doesn't do. But definitely the Bible teaches, Cliff, and demonstrates to all those persons who were baptized, to so Jesus himself who was baptized, that baptism is important for us when we accept Christ to demonstrate to the world that we are on Christ's side. It doesn't give you salvation. It's a demonstration. It's an outer demonstration of what you have already accepted. Yeah. All right? Yeah. I think, Elder, Elder Joseph, you have captured it well there. Mm -hmm. And you have mentioned earlier that Jesus did it also. Absolutely. All right? The Bible says, uh, He that believeth and is baptized 
shall be saved. He that mm -hmm. believes the gospel, he that repents mm -hmm. and is baptized. But Jesus got baptized. Mm -hmm. But Jesus didn't have to repent of anything. There you go. Because he wasn't a sinner. He didn't there sin. You go. But Jesus did it as an example for us to follow. Exactly. And I'm sure all of us would want to follow Jesus' example. And you know exactly that, that that baptism that Jesus did would suffice for the thief on the cross. Exactly. He could not have done it. Exactly. So Christ's baptism would suffice. That covers for him. There you exactly. Go. Exactly. There you go. All right. Okay. So I invite you all to stay with us as we take a break. We'll be right back. Thanks for staying with us. Welcome back to Informed. We just want to remind you, for those of our viewers, there are many who are viewing, but they're not subscribers to this channel. Remember to hit the subscribe button and importantly, hit the bell for notification of videos that are posted. And for those of you who want to get your questions into us, you can send them to the email victoryinjesusministries1 at gmail.com. We'll be delighted to answer your questions by email. All right, Elder David. We have more questions here, and we're looking now at a question from Deborah. And Deborah is asking a question which I've heard before from others. Mm -hmm. But she says, are people burning in hell right now? Because I have known people in my lifetime who died without accepting the Lord. Are they roasting in the fires of hell right now? That's a very, very interesting question, Elder David. Well, Deborah, I would like to say right out front, that your dead loved ones or those whom you're acquainted with that would have died outside of the Lord, they're not burning in hell presently. All right? I would like to say that out front. No, they're not, they're not roasting in hell. There are some Christian children who are taught that hell is a place located deep within the earth where the wicked are burning forever. I was told. I was told that. I was told that when I was young, Elder David. I was told that if you dig too far down, you might find you're going to find hell. <laughs> and, and and if you're in a coal mine somewhere in Russia, and they had some some incident where they dig too far down, there's some demons escape out of hell and came up on the earth. Well, we'll see what the Bible says about this. <laughs> Help us out here. Help us. All right. Yo, so they say they're burning there forever, and they say beginning the moment they die. Mm. All right. Others mm -hmm. teach that hell is located somewhere in the far reaches of the universe. Which one is true? Mm. Where is hell? And when does hell happen? I would like to say here that when one dies, he or she, whether or not they're saved, elder one, mm -hmm. he or she goes to the grave mm -hmm. and await the second coming of Christ. All right. Not to hell. All right. And I said, whether or not they are saved, mm -hmm. when one dies, they go to the grave and they wait the second coming of Christ. Now, the Bible tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangels and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, Elder Vaughan. Mm -hmm. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So says the Bible. Now, those who are righteous mm -hmm. and alive when Christ comes, the Bible says, they will be, the Bible says those who are dead, sorry, and are righteous, mm -hmm. when Christ comes, they'll be raised to life. All right. And the living who are righteous will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Mm -hmm. And he says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. They're going to be, according to the Bible, the righteous will go to heaven for 1,000 years. All right? The question follows then, Elder Paul and Elder Joseph, what happens to the wicked who are living at the time when Christ comes? Mm -hmm. Well, the Bible tells us that they're going to be struck dead by the brightness of his coming. All right? All right? So the wicked who are alive will be struck dead by the brightness of Christ's second coming. Now, what happens to the wicked who died before the coming of Christ? They will remain dead. Mm -hmm. 
So those who are wicked and alive will be struck dead. Those who are dead before his coming, they remain dead. They all stay in the grave. Okay. While the righteous go to heaven for 1,000 years. Mm -hmm. All right? So they don't go to hell when they die. Mm -hmm. They go to the grave and they stay there for 1,000 years. Now what happens next? Bible tells us after the 1,000 years, God's people will make their way back to earth. All right? Now let us see what the Bible says in Revelation 20, verses 7 to 10. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. I need to tell you, I, I told you what would happen to the wicked dead, the wicked and the righteous, mm -hmm. but I didn't tell you what would happen to Satan. Satan would be the only person alive on earth during the 1,000 years, when the righteous are in heaven mm -hmm. and the wicked are in the grave. But the Bible says, then Satan will be released from his prison. The world will be from his prison. He will be uh, bound by a chain of circumstances because he wouldn't have anyone to tempt. We don't want to go into all of that now. But Satan will be loose from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. They went up to the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And the fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophets are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now let's follow what is happening here. The Bible says that after the thousand years have passed, Satan will be released. And he will, by that time, the wicked who are dead will now be resurrected. Mm -hmm. Satan will pull off his last deception. God's people who are in heaven have, after the thousand years are finished, will be making their way back to earth in the city mm -hmm. of Jerusalem. Now, Satan will deceive those who the Bible describes as uh, like the sand of the sea, that look, we are more than them, so we can take the city. And they will seek to make war against God and the holy city, which, in which his people will be, mm -hmm. as it makes its way back to earth. And then the Bible says, fire will come down from God and devour them. This earth will become a lake of fire. And so essentially that's, that, that's hell then? That becomes hell. So the question really is then, is, is, is not where is hell, but when is hell? Exactly. Because this earth is going to be consumed mm -hmm. in, in a lake of fire, mm -hmm. as, as Revelation speaks about it. So then the answer, I believe, is that hell is going to take place at the end of time, Rather than hell happening all now. Exactly. Because if hell, is happening, if hell is happening now when people all die, we have people who are burning in hell from since, um, from since the beginning of from since exactly. Cain. From since people started to die, yeah. <laughs> from since Cain would have, would, have, would, have, would have died. Yes. And so that is inconceivable. It the is Bible inconceivable. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach that. So hell is coming in the future. In the future. In Excellent. the future. So for those who are worried that their loved ones are burning in hell, mm -hmm. you can breathe easy. All right. All right. So, so the question is, where will hell be? Hell will be right here on earth. Mm -hmm. When will it be? At the end of time, like you rightly said. And it will burn for just a time. It will burn, yes. It will not be burning forever and ever. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, the effects of the fire elder born will be forever. Okay. Those who born will be destroyed, mm -hmm. gone forever. That is what will be forever. You will be forever destroyed. You will not be burning perpetually. All right? Now, the Bible says that God will make new heavens and a new earth. Mm -hmm. This earth is where we're going to live forever. We're going to heaven for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. Then we are going to come back. Bible says fire will come down from heaven. We'll purify the earth. So this earth will be purified by fire. And then we are going to come back to live here. And here what the live on. This is another reason why I know that the fire is not going to be burning forever. Mm -hmm. If earth is going to be hell, and this is where we're going to be living eventually, mm -hmm. then it can't be on fire all the time. Unless we're all going to be living in hell. Exactly. <laughs> all right? Absolutely. I, I hope that, that satisfies you. All right, that, that certainly does. And I, 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 I pray that our, our, our viewer will indeed be um, satisfied with that response. Definitely. All right, so what else do we have here?
Okay, we have another question here on the board this time uh, from Travis. He says, how can anyone be sure that the biblical Sabbath is our current Saturday? Wasn't the calendar changed? Mm -hmm. How can we be sure that Saturday, as we know it today, mm -hmm. is really the Sabbath? I think essentially is what the question is. And he's asking about the calendar being changed. Yes. I've heard this before, Elder David. Mm -hmm. I've heard this many times where people say, well, how can you know? Which day of the week is the Sabbath for you who keep the Sabbath? Mm -hmm. um, the calendar was changed. And so the calendar changed and we lost it. We don't know where it is anymore. You're just choosing this day that we call Saturday and saying that it is a biblical Sabbath. But it is not because the whole calendar was changed. Well, let's look at it um, from what actually took place. Um, here is it that we have in... We, can be, we, we actually can be positive, you know, Elder David. We can that our seventh day is the same day that Jesus kept when he was here on this earth. Mm -hmm. If you look at Luke 4 and verse 16, that gives us insight. Yes. The days of the week have never been confused. Never. And so here's why some people ask this question about the calendar being changed and the Sabbath has been somehow lost. Going back into a little of history here. Because the question that Travis asks is, wasn't the calendar changed? Mm -hmm. So let's go back in history. Before 1582, the year 1582, Travis, the world went by what was called Elder David, the Julian calendar, mm -hmm. from the Roman emperor Julius Caesar. So we had the Julian calendar. Now, this was implemented in BC 46, or uh, 46 BC. The Julian calendar had calculated that the world took, or the earth took 365 and a quarter days to rotate around the sun. In actuality, it took 11 minutes more. Hmm. Now, those 11 minutes accumulated each year until by 1582, the calendar was 10 days out of harmony with the solar system. Interesting. Right? So on October 4th, 1582, Pope Gregory the 13th, he issued a papal bull. We can't have going to time to describe what a papal bull is, but basically the Pope said, hey, look, this is it. We have a new calendar. Elder David, that calendar was called, it was Pope Gregory, so that, that calendar was called the Gregorian, Gregorian calendar. Mm -hmm. And this is the calendar that we use today. Now, I'm answering the question. All the countries switched to the Gregorian calendar. <clears throat> they would lose a number of days, bringing their calendar into a closer alignment with the solar system. The longer the country would have waited to change from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar is the more days they will have to take out of their calendar. And so, for example, most European countries, they, 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 they switch right away when the papal bull came out to switch to the Gregorian calendar to adjust for those 11 days that were not accounted for in the Julian calendar. So on Thursday, for example, October 4th, 1582, the change from the Julian to the Gregorian calendar, the next day would have been, instead of October 5th, it would be October 15th. But the next day from Thursday would be Friday. Not from Thursday to some other day of the week, but the consecutive counting of the days remain the same. <laughs> so no matter how many days a country would have taken out, because America didn't switch to the Gregorian calendar until 1752. They had to take out 11 days. And then we had places like um, Turkey that switched to the Gregorian calendar in 1927. They had to take out 13 days. But no matter how many days, and this is the point, no matter how many days that you lost by switching, from the, switching to the Gregorian calendar, this is the point. The weekly cycle was not affected at all. Friday still followed Thursday, and Saturday still followed Friday. The same seventh day remained Elder David. Mm -hmm. So if you talk about the calendar being changed and so on and so forth, you need to look at it carefully and not just you know, run it off like that and say, well, it was changed. Because it was changed, but the cycle of the days never changed. 
Okay, October 4th on one day, Thursday. The next day would have been October 15th, Friday. All right? So here is it that it wasn't lost. And because the weekly cycle is completely independent of, of, of lunar and solar and the solar system, we can be positive that we rest and worship in observing the Saturday or the Sabbath as we know it from creation. Mm -hmm. All right? And a question, Elder David, mm -hmm. and for you also, um, <coughs> Travis. If I can't find Sabbath on the calendar because it changed, well, then how can somebody find Sunday or any other day for that matter? We should, we, <laughs> then we, should, we, we shouldn't be able to find any of the days. We shouldn't be able to find any of the days, you know? And so it is the changing of the calendar happened, that's a fact, but it did not change the, 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 the weekly cycle. And, and, and you know, Elder David, today we, 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 we look at the account in the Gospels mm -hmm. where Christ was crucified on what day? Bible says the preparation day, we know it to be a Friday. Right. And Hence it says that he rested. On, we, we know that crucifixion day to be Good Friday. Right. And everybody accepts Good Friday. Well, it's not everybody or those who are Christians and, and follow mm -hmm. that, they accept Good Friday. And everybody knows Easter Sunday. Yes, we know And so what comes between Easter Sunday and Good Friday? The Sabbath. Absolutely. Yes. It's right there in the yes. Word of God. If, if, we, if we look at um, the book of Luke, chapter 23, mm -hmm. beginning from verse 52, mm -hmm to Luke 24 and verse 1. Mm -hmm. We will see just what you're describing. The, exactly. The Good Friday. Just read it and you'll see. And, and just to throw this in as, as brought, you know, to answer the question for you, Travis, is that when you look at the name of Saturday in many other languages across the world, you'll be surprised, or maybe you're not surprised, but you'll be surprised to see what's the name of Saturday in these other countries and languages. Mm -hmm. For example, let me just pull a few. Um, in, 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 in Belarusian, it's Sibota. In Croatian, it's Subota. In Georgian, it's Shabbati. In Italian, it's Sabato. In Polish, it's Sobato. In Portuguese, Sabado. In Spanish, Subota. And in, sorry, in Russian, Subota. And in Spanish, Sabado. Elder David, that just shows that, hey, look, how, how, how is it possible that all these different countries and languages have Saturday being called in the language? Sabbath still. Sabbath still. So, that's not coincidental. <laughs> the, the, the calendar was changed, but the calendar did not interrupt the weekly cycle of days. That's the answer that I have for you, Travis. I hope that it satisfies your request. Yes. We have another question here, the David from Doris. And she says, in Daniel chapter 3, wasn't the three Hebrew boys being presumptuous in thinking that God would save them from the furnace? You know, that, that's a good question because some people say, boy, them, them three boys are just presumptuous. But tell us, Aldell David, answer Doris' question for her. No, they weren't presumptuous. Okay, that's a short answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, 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 I'll say why I, why I said no. Uh -huh. All right? Now, the Bible tells us that faith is the substance of things hoped for, mm -hmm. the evidence of things not seen. Now, Elder Vaughan and Doris, the Hebrew boys were in captivity in Babylon. Isn't that so? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, they were accustomed to worshiping the Creator God. The God who commanded that we should not worship any other God but the Creator. Absolutely. All right? And, and, and that commandment specifically says that we should not bow down to any idol, any graven image. All right? So that when Nebuchadnezzar, in defiance of the Creator God, mm -hmm. set up his image and commanded, that, commanded everyone to bow down and worship him, they refused. All right? To do what he commanded. Mm -hmm. Because they knew that in doing what he commanded them to do, they would be dishonoring their God, okay. the creator God. Mm -hmm. And they refused to do that. And, and, and they trusted God to deliver them. Mm -hmm. Now, they well knew that God could have chosen, for whatever reason, not to deliver them. But they decided that rather than dishonoring God, mm -hmm. they would rather bow. They would rather bow. They would rather burn, sorry. Mm -hmm. They would rather burn than dishonor their God. All right? So it was not presum presumption. They were not presumptuous. Mm -hmm. All right? And Elder Vaughan, I would dare say that this stance they took of preferring to burn than bow mm -hmm. is the way we as Christians should live our lives. Mm. That's, All a, right. that's a very serious thing because today we see, um, well, I see 
many Christians, and I'm, I'm just saying it as I say it, who are just Christians nominally, by name only. But when you're put to the test, you either wilt or you shun or you hide or whatever. But these three boys, they stood up with their life being faced. And so, or, or I should say, they're facing death. Yes. And um, they, they, they stood up for Christ. They, they, they knew who they believed in. Exactly. And that's the important thing. Exactly. They weren't being presumptuous. They knew who they believed in. And even if he didn't come to in that instance, they said, hey, look, God is the one we're going to serve. Exactly. And that's a lot of backbone, exactly. Elder. Exactly. And, there, and so there are times when we are going to find ourselves in situations mm -hmm. where we are called upon to make a stand. Mm -hmm. And like the Hebrew boys, we ought to be prepared to stand for what we believe, mm -hmm. regardless of the consequences. So it was not presumption. All right. It was faith in their God. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, guess what? That brings us to the end of our questions for this episode of Informed. Um, we're going to take a final break. We're going to be back. We're going to be having a word of prayer for those who have sent in their questions. We pray that the answers were sufficient. If perchance they were not, we're going to be dropping some links in, in, in the YouTube um, video at the bottom. You could go to those links and do some further studies. Uh, but we pray that the Holy Spirit will continue to move upon your heart. But we're going to take a break. We're going to be right back with a word of prayer. We thank you for continuing to view Inform. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to Informed. We, thanks for staying. we thank you for staying with us on this episode. As we close today, I'm going to ask Elder David mm -hmm. to give us a word of prayer for those who would have viewed and those who have sent their questions, those who still have unanswered questions, we're going to be praying for you at this point in time. Elder David, pray for us, please. And the soul loving Lord, uh, we are so very grateful for this privilege that we could have been instruments that you used today to bless your people. We thank you, dear God, for the questions that came. We thank you, dear God, for the answers that you enabled us to give. We trust, dear God, that those who sent their questions, that the answers would have, their questions would have been answered and that they would have been blessed. Dear God, if we have fallen down in any way, we know that you will make it up. We ask, dear God, that you continue to bless this program, continue to bless us, bless all those who are viewing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, folks. May God continue to bless you as we come back with another episode of Informed. Until then, continue to study the Word of God. Continue to let Him to guide you. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for viewing. Have a wonderful day.